Okay, so uh, welcome to the next of the metaphysics interviews. Uh, today we're talking to Carrie Jenkins, who is Associate Professor and Reader of Philosophy here at the University of Nottingham. So, hello Carrie. Hi. Okay, so our first question for you. Uh, could you begin by giving us, in your own words, uh, kind of a very brief outline of how you understand the debate surrounding the existence and nature of numbers? Okay, um, well the way I see things, um, there's a very obvious and natural answer to the question whether there are any numbers, and the answer is yes. Um, so everybody talks all the time as if there were a number between three and five, the number four. Nobody seems to have any qualms about that. Indeed, if you ask the people who are supposed to be experts about numbers, mathematicians, they will also tell you that there is a number, at least one number, between three and five. Um, but on the other hand, um, some people seem to think that this is slightly worrying, this answer. Because these things, these numbers that we seem to believe in, that everybody seems happy to accept, um, are a little bit weird in some ways. I mean, you can't find them in the world, you can't bump into them or trip over them or prod them or take them into the chemistry lab and find out what they're made of and so on. Okay, so um, this leads people to, to be a bit suspicious about the metaphysical commitment to um, things like numbers because they're presumably going to have these weird properties which uh, added together people tend to call being abstract. Um, and then either because they are physicalists, right, because they want to say that everything's physical, or they have some other general view that commits them to rejecting objects like these, or because they're just directly suspicious of numbers or abstract objects in, in general. Um, uh, the people on the other side of this debate want to say that there are no numbers, despite what the natural and um, uh, apparently expert uh, answer is. Okay, that, that's great. So, so then I, I wonder if we could begin by sort of beginning to press you on this. So, so what, if anything, do you think that our number talk picks out? Um, so I'm with uh, I'm with the experts and uh, the, the people on the street saying that there are numbers. Um, I think that what we what we're talking about when we're talking about numbers is those things, those abstract objects. Um, that uh, when I say they're abstract, I mean they're not located in space and time. They don't have any causal properties. They don't interact causally with um, physical things. Um, nevertheless, I think they exist, and I think when we talk about, when we talk, say that there's a number between three and five, we're talking about the abstract object, the number four. Okay, that's great, thank you. And, and why do you take that view? Mm. Um, well, uh, there are two main reasons. One is that I think this is the default view that everybody should take until they've got reasons to reject it. Um, and partly this is because it's what everybody thinks, it's sort of common sense, partly it's because it's what the experts think mathematicians think. Um, so there's part, it's partly that, but also I think when I do take a, a more reflective attitude um, and I think about um, uh, what my, uh, the way I conceive of um, the mathematical facts, if you like, I think about like, my concepts of the numbers three and five and the concept of another number between the two of those. Um, just examining those concepts is enough, I think, to give me a reason to believe in the existence of the number four. Um, so I think that I can know about the existence of numbers just by examining my concepts. Okay, the reason I think that that works is because I think that um, when I talk about my concepts of the numbers, um, I'm not just talking about mental representations that I happen to have. I mean, my concepts are mental representations, that's why I can know about them just by thinking and not by sort of going to the lab and prodding things. But they're not just mental representations, they also are connected to the things that they're representations of. Okay, so in particular, um, my concept of the number four, there's a reason why I have a concept with this structure. Um, and a concept which is such that examining it, perhaps in conjunction with others, enables me to know that there is such a thing as the number four. Um, and I, what I say is that the reason I have that concept is because of how my experience of the world has been up till now. Um, cut a long story very short, um, my experience of the world up till now has been such as to make that concept really useful, in fact perhaps indispensable, for making sense of my experience. So that concept um, has proved itself to me um, in making sense of my experience, so now I can rely on it to learn about the existence of the number four. Okay, that's great, thank you very much for okay. that. Um, so, could you then tell us a little bit about what you think the biggest problem that this kind of view faces, and, and maybe how you do, or, or how you'd be tempted to try and respond to that problem? Um, well, it depends exactly what you mean by this type of view. So, I mean, if you just mean the view that numbers exist and are abstract objects. 
then a usual objection is that there's no explanation of how epistemologically we can deal with that fact. I mean, how could we have knowledge of these abstract objects? And my answer to that consists in the kind of epistemological story that I was just spelling out. Okay. Um, so if we were to impress you on that specific view? Right, right. So if you, if you mean by my view, all this yeah, epistemological all this stuff, stuff yeah. as well. Um, well, I mean, there, there, are, there are several points at which one can worry about this. Let me just pick one. Um, so when I, when I talk about um, um, the, the relationship between concepts and experience, when I say that uh, uh, the reason I can trust my concept is because it's proved itself to me by being useful for making sense of my experience, um, there are various things that people could object to there. So, for example, people could say, look, um, okay, the concept is useful for making sense of experience, but that doesn't mean it's in any way correlated with truths about the world, right? What makes you think that just because it's useful to you, you can learn truths by examining it, and perhaps in conjunction with other concepts? Um, my response to that type of objection is going to be um, analogous to what's sometimes called the no miracles argument in the philosophy of science. Right? When you think about your scientific theories, um, and you notice that they work really, really well, um, you might think that's a, that's a bit miraculous unless the theories are actually getting it right. right? So unless you say that they're true, you've got this sort of miraculous fact that they all happen to work really well and enable you to build aeroplanes and computers and that sort of thing. Um, similarly, I want to say these concepts, if they just happen to be you know, really useful for making sense of your experience, and that fact is not explained by their correlating to arithmetical reality, then you've got, again, a, a miracle or a mystery on your hands. You need an explanation of why they're so successful. Okay. Thank you very much. So, if then we were to, to try and, and force you to take another view of numbers, so thinking about that numbers are abstract objects, or uh, whether we can say something else about the nature of numbers, um, and we were f absolutely forced you to come down on, on, on a, a second view, what would that view be, and, and, and why don't you take that particular view? Um, I think if I were forced to take an alternative view, um, I would take the view that there aren't in fact these abstract objects, um, but the way we talk is as if there were these abstract objects. So um, probably this would put me in, in the fictionalist camp, at, at least according to many definitions. Yeah. Um, so um, in some ways our, our, our talk of numbers is a little bit like um, our talk of Bilbo Baggins. We say that there, there was a hobbit of this kind and he lived in this time and place. We, uh, in some sense, don't really mean it. Nevertheless, it's useful for various purposes to talk that way. Um, we could say the same thing about um, numbers. It's useful for various purposes, perhaps for scientific purposes especially, to talk as if there are numbers even though there really aren't. Um, that's an alternative view that um, captures a lot of what I think is appealing about the, 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 um, the view that I actually take, um, which is that you know, we really do seem to talk as if there are these numbers. Um, I think that's an important datum that we need, to, um, we need to respect. I mean, an alternative view is to say, look, we're not actually talking as if there are numbers, although it sounds like it. We're saying things like there are numbers, and we aren't really thereby um, saying that there are numbers. I don't like that type of view. I suppose that, that one could say that that's another kind of fictionalism, right? Um, but I like the versions of fictionalism which say that our talk literally does mean that there are numbers, it's just that we're in some sense distanced from that commitment by the attitude that we have to the things that we say. I don't actually hold yes, that with that yes. um, Basically, because I think we don't need to. I mean, we've got a much simpler explanation of why we talk as if there are numbers and why that's useful for us, which is that there are, um, and we're getting at the truth. And I think the only reason for rejecting that account is if there turn out to be some insuperable problems with it, like, say, the epistemological problem. But I don't think that the epistemological problem is insuperable. So okay. That's why I don't hold this view. Thank you very much. So, on to the, 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 the final question then. Um, and this is a question we've been asking everyone to try and give us a, a sense of the flavour of different um, ways in which people approach metaphysics. So there is sometimes a temptation to regard um, philosophers as locked away in their ivory tower doing this very abstract and uninteresting, useless kind of uh, activity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was wondering how you would respond both to the accusation that thinking about the nature of numbers is kind of a pointless activity, uh, and then more specifically about whether or not metaphysics in general um, comes under just under the heading of just being kind of pointless. Um, well, my answer is going to be the same pretty much in both cases. Um, 
and it's going to depend a little bit on what exactly you mean by pointless, because I think there are some people for whom this kind of activity would be completely pointless, namely people who are um, just not interested in these questions, can't see the value in them for, for you know, just for the value, uh, can't see the value in intellectual endeavour for its own sake, and so on. I think for those people, um, thinking too hard about questions like this is pretty pointless. They're not going to enjoy it, they're not going to get anything out of it. Um, on the other hand, I think there are plenty of people who do see the value in this, um, and um, for, for those people, the point of doing this stuff is that it provides them with a source of um, a great depth of understanding of the world that they live in um, and themselves, um, which is not only um, a good thing in its own right, it's also just a very enjoyable activity. And I think it's something that people value just intrinsically and for its own sake. Okay, that's great. Right, well, thank you for yeah. taking the time to talk yeah. to us today. No problem.